Hello, Sports Spectrum listeners. Happy 2022. Just want to take a moment to say Happy New Year to everyone listening. Really appreciate all of your support here at Sports Spectrum. I can't believe we're going on year five of this podcast, and it's been my honor to host this, produce this, and be with you each and every show. We have a great conversation today with Kyle Eidelman coming up. Just want to remind you about our Sports Spectrum weekly slant show that's on Wednesday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern. You can stream it live. It's the only football and faith show out there. And listen, we're into January now, and that's the time when the playoffs start to kick in. You got the best matchups you can find, right, when you get into the playoffs, and then you have all that excitement leading up to February 13th and in the Super Bowl, and it's just a great time of year if you're a football fan. But being that it's 2022, I want to remind you of this Sports Spectrum Weekly Slant show. It's been so much fun doing this the past three, four months, and really excited about where it's going. Uh, the fact that it's a show every single week, it's a lot of work, but we have had some incredible guests, coaches, players, even some high school players. It's been awesome to bring Jesus into the football conversation. So go check it out Wednesday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern, Sports Spectrum's weekly slant on our Facebook channel, our YouTube channel, and at sportspectrum.com. This is the Sports Spectrum Podcast, where faith and sports intersect. Now let's bring in our host, former ESPN producer, Jason Romano. And welcome everyone to the show. I am Jason, and this is the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Make sure you check out our website, sportspectrum.com. And if you have a guest idea or a show topic, you can email me, jason at sportspectrum.com, jason at sportspectrum.com. Maybe you have a coach or a player a former coach, a former player, a pastor like Kyle Eidelman. Maybe you know of a speaker, an author, somebody that you think we should talk to here on the show. Maybe you know this person. Well, feel free to email me, jason at sportspectrum.com. Now, Kyle Eidelman is our guest. He's the senior pastor at Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. It's one of the 10 largest churches in the United States. He speaks to more than 30,000 people each weekend, that number alone gives me like, whoa, 30,000 people hearing my message. That's got to be incredible. We'll talk to Kyle about that. He's also a best-selling author, and he wrote a book back maybe a decade or so ago called Not a Fan. And when I read that, I thought, wow, this is an incredible book, Not a Fan, talking about being a fan of Jesus instead of being a follower of Jesus. I think there's a lot of fans of Jesus out there, but man, to be a follower is to be sold out for Christ. And Kyle really helped me. I know he helped some of the people that we ministered in our Bible study with this book too. So it's been really cool to kind of know him from afar for many years. Now he has this new book coming out, releasing January 11th called One at a Time, The Unexpected Way God Wants to Use You to Change the world. So this is Kyle Eidelman, senior pastor, and we talk a lot of sports here too. This one at a time concept with his book relates really well to coaching, to the athletic world. And man, we talk about a lot of coaches, including one of the great coaches of all time, John Wooden. This was a fantastic conversation with Kyle Eidelman. Take a listen to it right now on Sports Spectrum. We're happy to have you here on the show today, Kyle. Thanks for being here. It's the new year. Uh, as your book is releasing January 11th, the new book, One at a Time, The Unexpected Way God Wants to Use You to Change the World. So it's 2022 as we release this as well, just a couple days before the book's coming out. It's weird to say that um, because it, it feels like what we just went through for almost the past two years with COVID and the pandemic and everything else, and we're still kind of trying to exit out of this and we can't quite get there yet. Uh, it's kind of weird. When you think about this upcoming year, what, what comes to mind for you when you're thinking about 2022? You know, I 
said throughout the last you know year and a half, I have gained a new appreciation for the phrase "Lord willing." <laughs> like <laughs> in the past, I would hear people say that, and it seemed like kind of an old school phrase that you just tagged on to different comments that you made. You know, well, Lord willing, I now use that phrase on a pretty regular basis. You know, I have learned that nothing is guaranteed. There's a lot of uncertainty. You know, a lot of ways that I would have measured success, or I would have. Um, measured the effectiveness of my life, those things um, got refined. In fact, I would say that one of the primary motivators for this book, one at a time, was the way God has used this season to help me focus on what really matters. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of ways to measure success and find our identity. And it doesn't matter if you're, um, you know, coaching a team and you're finding success on a win loss record, or you're a pastor of a church and you're finding success by how many people come to your church. Like there's all kinds of ways that we can get caught up in. Here's the purpose of my life. And here's how I'm going to measure my effectiveness. But when I studied through the gospels, I just see that, the way Jesus had influence and impact was one life at a time. And, and so I think as we go into this new year, that is a really, no matter where you are, no matter how many people are in your circle of influence, no matter how many followers you have on social media, that the Jesus way of making a difference in the world is one person at a time. And I think that's a great theme. That's a great uh, focus for us as we begin 2022. So you use that word success, uh, and in the sports world, success is clearly judged by wins and losses and yards gained and, and awards and accolades and even contracts, right? Which are good things. All of them are great things, but let's pretend you're talking to athletes or coaches. Cause I know you've ministered to coaches as well about true success. What would you say to them, especially if you're coming from the biblical Jesus um, sort of model, as you just mentioned, the way that he might talk about in the Gospels, what would you say is kind of the definition of success in your eyes? You know, one of the coaches that I got to know late in his life, um, he attended a church that I've regularly preached at in Los Angeles County was Coach John Wooden. Yeah. And I was a little bit too young to uh, be a part of history when he was uh, the coach at UCLA. But of course, you know, he is, he was a legend. And as I spent some time with him in that church, one of the things I learned is that his legacy was much more about people than it was a record. Like, yeah, absolutely. You know, he set records and, um, and that's what a lot of people would know about him. But when you're around him and you're around the people that he influenced, what really mattered was those one at a time moments. In fact, I would say that for a lot of your listeners, if they look back on their athletic life, they probably would find um, that it was different coaches, different assistant coaches, you know, different players. For me, I think of an upperclassman that had a really big impact on me. And, and so the further I get away from that season, the less I think about a record or I think about a trophy or title, um, the less I remember things like, you know, points and rebounds and assists, the more I am aware of the impact certain people on the team had on me and opportunities that I had with other people. And, and so I, I think in, that's true in any any context, right? Like you can get caught up in the non relationship side of it, but, but ultimately legacy is not going to be about, uh, you know, putting up hall of fame numbers. It's ultimately going to be about the people who you invested in and the um, eternal impact that you had in their lives. That's, it's really well said coach wooden. I mean, that were you in awe when you, I remember this, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh -huh. Wooden. So it was, I started my career at ESPN in 2000. So 21 years ago now. And I remember doing a show called uh, the legends on ESPN radio, which was a show I used to produce. And we would have like the, the title says legends from the world of sports on to kind of talk about their careers. It was kind of a podcast sort of show before podcasting was even around on the radio. And we had got John Wooden on and he calls. And usually these legends won't just call into the show. They'll have their 
you know, associate or their PR person and they'll hand them the phone or something and the phone rings and John Wooden calls. And it's like this, and I haven't really shared this before. It's like this soft, quiet, yes. gentle voice mm -hmm. at probably not, I don't know what he was in 2001, but 90 something, I'm sure mm -hmm. early nineties. And I thought this is like, the. You know, I talked to him for 15 seconds, right? It was really quick. And then I just put him on hold and then we put him on the show and we taped the interview. But I thought to myself, this is the, one of the coolest moments for 15 seconds, right? That I've ever had talking to this legend, John Wooden. Uh, what was it like for you? Did you meet him? Did you have a chance to talk to him? Yes, yeah, I spent some time with him. And yeah. um, one of the things that I appreciated about him uh, is that he did not underestimate the power of his words and his influence while at the same time being very humble and non-assuming. So for example, uh, if I got done preaching, he would come and encourage me. He would tell me two or three things that he really appreciated about my message. He always took notes, Wow, you know, is incredibly humbling. And, and then um, when I first met him, he did that, encouraged me, uh, said a few positive things, but he didn't introduce himself, didn't uh, presume to know that I knew who he was. And, you know, after he talked for a few minutes, I, you know, I said, Hey, coach, I, I know who you are. And <laughs> this is a big moment for me. So, you know, yeah. and, and then the other thing I remember is sitting in a prayer breakfast, a men's prayer breakfast um, at the same table with him and, and watching as he took, uh, as he took notes, listening to the speaker mm. and, and just thinking, okay, you know what, if, if he's taking notes then I need to be taking notes too. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I was really grateful for uh, just being able to see some of that and experience that. That's such a cool story. And what a legend he is. I was thinking about this too, with the title of your book, it's called one at a time. That's very much sort of a model or a cliche in some ways used by coaches. And mm -hmm. I thought, man, that's probably a neat, way to to connect this book in some ways for coaches and i know we talked before we started recording about the impact coaches have had on your journey and on your life and kind of what they've had on you could you kind of share a little bit more about maybe the impact that some of the coaches in your life have have had on you yeah you know it's interesting because i'll be positive here but it would also be easy to go negative right like sure. i i think there were some coaches who had no idea how much weight their words carried in a negative way. You know, the Bible talks about that words have the power of life and death. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think I had some coaches who were pretty naive to that and, um, you know, could be very harsh and uh, critical in order to try and get, you know, better performance. But then I also had some coaches who really went out of their way to um, speak that life into me. And, um, you know, I remember having a, a coach in junior high who um, I, I don't remember exactly what the event was that caused him to leave practice. It was basketball. And um, and he called me over um, and he said, hey, I'm going to have you run the rest of practice. I see a lot of leadership in you. You can handle this. I have some things I need to go take care of. I, I don't know what he had to go take care of, but I can't tell you what an impact that had on me as a leader to think that he saw that in me and uh, was handing that practice over to me. Um, that had a huge impact on the trajectory of my life and um, leaning into God's leadership calling over me. Um, I don't know if he would even remember it, right? Like that might just have, <laughs> like I may have been helping him out. He may have needed to go uh, run carpool, yeah. uh, but, or he may have been very, in, I, I would guess he was very intentional with that, that that was, uh, that's something he, it was something he did on purpose. But, but some of those moments, my guess is, you know, anyone who's been involved in athletics could probably point to a few things like that. Um, where someone leaned in and said something to you. you, you know, one of the points I make in the book uh, is that the right word at the right time has incredible power. Um, the, you know, the right word at a fine time might be impactful, but the right word at just the right time can go a long way. And um, I, I do think that coaches, teachers uh, have some parents certainly have some unique opportunities if they're paying attention the right word from the right person at the right time, you know, Proverbs says is like gold. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Kyle Eidelman is our guest here 
on Sports Spectrum. Again, that new book, One at a Time, The Unexpected Way God Wants to Use You to Change the World, releases January 11th. We'll talk more about that book in a second. When, when did that right word for you kind of be spoken into your life that you realized your calling was to go and pastor and sort of books and other, other things kind of come with that. But where does that, where does that opportunity for you or that mindset or even that calling from God take place when you realize I'm being called into ministry? You know, I, I say that God tricked me into this. (laughs) If you would have asked me when I was 16, what do you want to do with your life? I would have told you, I don't know what I want to do, but I know what I don't want to do. I don't want to be a preacher. I don't want to be a pastor. And, uh, and I think, you know, that's, that's just like an invitation to God. So I, I was in high school and I, I'm a little embarrassed to admit this, but Mm -hmm. my first job ever, uh, was as a precious moments tour guide. Do you know what precious moments are, Jason? Have you ever heard of those? Uh, yes. I, I, okay. I feel like they're little, I don't even know how to describe them. They're like these little yeah. dolls or kind yeah, of figurines, figurines, figurines right? Yes. Drop eyes. Yeah. My wife had a couple of those when I first met her in the nineties. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. That would be about the right timeline. Yeah. Uh, kind of like the, uh, uh, porcelain beanie babies <laughs> yes. kind of would collect them. And so I got a job in high school as a tour guide for this uh, precious moments chapel that we had. And <laughs> I just, I just did it to make a little bit of money. But part of that job was to get up in front of large groups of people and take them on tours. Right. Um, I didn't mind doing it. I got really comfortable with public speaking Uh, Part of Precious Moments had a faith element to it. So I had all kinds of moments on that job to talk about uh, the gospel, to talk about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I started I started down that path. And and then when I turned 18, there was some small church in town that asked me to come preach. And and I said, well, yeah, sure, I'll I'll come. Why not? They needed somebody to fill in last minute. And so I came and did that. And they said, you want to come back the next week? And I'm like, okay, I'll come back the next week. And, and, and then after I'd been there five or six weeks, I walked, I walked out of the sanctuary and into the lobby. There was this little piece of paper up on the wall um, that said, Kyle Eidelman, senior minister. And I'm like, what, wait, what happened? <laughs> nobody, nobody ran that by me. And it just <laughs> happened. And I, I was there for four years throughout college and, and then went to Los Angeles uh, County to start a new church. Um, but I do feel like God brought me down that path and I was pretty far down it before I realized, you know, what he had done. And I really think that that's oftentimes the way God's will and God's calling works. You know, it's more of a, an adventure of faith. He doesn't always say, here's the whole uh, five-year plan. In right. fact, so he almost never does that. It's very rare, you know, but you know, as I tell my kids, one thing leads to another, <laughs> you know, you just do the next thing and you don't know where it's going to lead, but it'll lead somewhere. And then that'll lead somewhere. And, and you just have faith that, uh, that God is going to direct your path and he will. Um, but it was, it was not a burning bush moment for me. <laughs> well, it's, it's leaning not on your own understanding. How's that yeah, you know, right. going to the book of Proverbs and then, but it's one thing, to be giving a, a, a guided tour, if you will, to, I don't know, 50, 100 people, maybe it's less than that. It's another thing to be speaking to, in many ways, 30,000 people every week, like you do with the church that you're pastoring at now, Southeast Christian Church in Louisville. Um, that's got to be, in, I don't know, I'm just thinking about that. Maybe you don't think about numbers, you're just thinking about one, the one, right? One at a time. But performing, it's not performing, but it's 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 a lot like athletes where you're in front of a crowd of very large amounts of people each week. Do you get nervous when you, when you're knowing that your role as a senior pastor is going to be heard by, you know, that amount of people, a vast amount of people every week? You know, I remember the, one of the first times I spoke in front of a large crowd and this has a ton of parallel to athletics, but mm. I was getting ready to speak in front of a large crowd and I was really nervous. That's what I would have said. You know, my, uh, Palms were sweaty, the, uh, you, you know, a dry mouth. Uh, and then one of my professors came back and they said to me, one of my professors came backstage and they said, hey, are you, are you nervous? And I said, um, yeah, I'm so, so nervous. And he kind of went through the symptoms of nervousness with me. Yeah. And, uh, and then he, he said, ah, you're not nervous. You're excited. Gave me a slap on the back. And, 
And I really appreciated him reframing it, right? Because I'm like, he's right. I, I am excited. And mm. being able to uh, make the distinction between being nervous and being excited. A lot of the symptoms are the same. I go with excited over nervous. That's, yeah. that's what I, that's what I uh, say to myself, you know, because I am excited. So I, I do think, you know, when there's a lot at stake and there are a lot of eyes on you, then it's appropriate to um, have some nerves or to be excited. So it's an important moment, significant moment, and you want to make the most of it. Um, so I don't think of it as being nervous. I think of it as being excited, but it has all the same symptoms. Well, especially, and when you have, like you said, a lot of eyes on you, um, there's a responsibility too. I remember the very first time I spoke at my church and my church is much smaller, obviously it's maybe 350 people here in Connecticut. And I remember being asked by my pastor maybe five, six years ago to speak for the first time. And I thought, my goodness, what a responsibility to stand up at a pulpit on a Sunday morning in front of people and be able to preach the gospel. I felt a heaviness, a weight to that. And I still feel that. And I've done that a lot more now, five years later than I did then. But I thought, my goodness, that's such a weight, a heaviness to make sure that I'm representing Christ in the best way possible and preaching his gospel, not something that is fake or watered down or even my own. Yeah. I wanted to preach Jesus. And I'm just wondering for you, when you have that many eyeballs on you, is there, is there something that you put into place to having done this for so many years now to protect um, the sanctity of the gospel, I guess, and to protect yourself from, I don't know, for lack of a better word, from falling, right? Yeah, and from absolutely. keeping yourself accountable and, and having people around you. I'm just wondering when you're leading such a large congregation, what are some of the things that you've put into place to help, you know, prevent some of the things that you've seen, unfortunately, in some other places? Yeah, you know, one of the one of the things that I find to be especially effective would be a one at a time practice where when I'm working on a message or writing a message, I typically will write two or three names in the top corner of my uh, message. And I will largely gear that message to those one, two, three people. And mm -hmm. what I've discovered is if I'm writing it with them in mind, there are a lot of other people that are in similar places on the journey. And it has a way of making sure the gospel um, is uh, rightly handled when, when you're not just presenting things theoretically, but you're taking truth and you're speaking it directly to somebody's life. The other thing I do is when I'm up in front on stage, I typically will within the first few minutes kind of scan through the church and I find a few people that I know um, need this message and um, I'm amazed at how oftentimes God answers that prayer you, you know I don't feel like I have to work at it I'm, I'm up there and then I see you know a, a couple uh, you know eight rows back and and the minute I see them and have them in mind and on my heart then how I present that message uh, becomes more pastoral. It becomes grace filled. Sometimes it becomes more challenging. It becomes a little bit more um, confrontive. Uh, I'm I'm just a little more aware of of the person. And so this is very much the the ministry model of Jesus, where we consistently see that there were large crowds around him, but he had a way of focusing on the one. I think pastors in in my position, uh, you know, can sometimes get into some challenging situations because they they become and i've done this before like i've found myself in seasons like this they become inaccessible mm -hmm. um yeah. so you know they spend more and more time in the office more and more time backstage um more and more time at home and the very people that they're called to pastor and love they're not spending any time with and so you know there is no substitute for getting you know, getting out of the house, getting out of the office, getting around uh, the people that God has called you to love. And, um, and so I work hard at that. I, I, I would say that, you know, I still have a long way to go, but I recognize how important that is. In fact, I would say most of the time when I'm struggling, um, whether it's writing a message or, or whether it's uh, just feeling a little burnt out, it's because I'm neglecting life on life ministry. Mm -hmm. There's just no substitute for uh, being a part of God's uh, transformative work in the life of an individual. 
Um, and so, you know, when I have a weekend down, I'll try to go to um, an addiction recovery center where we have we have church every weekend there, uh, but I don't get to always attend. Um, and, and so I love to go and spend time at their addiction recovery center or, um, you know, it might be at a, uh, a, a state penitentiary that's not you know too far down the road. Um, I, so to me, that keeps the gospel rightly focused on the on its purpose. It keeps my heart rightly engaged um, in mission and not in uh, you know how many people are coming and all these other ways that can pull you off sides. Yeah, and that steers me right into the book, which I do want to ask a question or two about it, because when you look at one at a time, it makes sense. But when you look at the subtitle, the unexpected way God wants to use you to change the world, I'm sure people listening or reading that might think, "How, Kyle, how am I going to be able to change the world? So when you hear somebody that might say that, explain why this book can help them and kind of what the concept is of being able to change the world, because a lot of people think I'm just trying to get up every day and make it through this day and parent and go and be a husband or wife, go to my job, come home and try to find some room for God in that. And and then what are you talking about when you say change the world? So kind of help, help us understand that. Yeah. You know, it's really about leaning into the types of moments that you just described, you know, mm-hmm. the everyday moments where we look around and we realize, okay, here are some people in my circle of influence. Here's some people that God has put in my path. Um, how can I, make the most of those opportunities for the kingdom. Um, I, I, I think when most people hear the phrase, you know, change the world, they think, okay, well, you know, maybe that's for, you know, the athlete that has a few million, few million followers on, on Instagram, you know, maybe that's for um, the person who, you know, has um, all kinds of Facebook friends or, you know, their, their uh, podcasts or they, you know, yeah. it's for the people who have these public platforms, but, but I would argue that the people who've had the most influence and impact in, you know, in your life and in my life are not people who, you know, I don't really know, but I follow on social media. And I'm not saying they don't encourage me. Um, I'm not saying a, like a podcast doesn't uh, help disciple me or challenge me, but the, the people who impact me are people who I spend time with. I know their names. They know mine. Um, I understand part of their journey. They, they've heard my story. And, and so real impact and influence, or, you know, our a movement that would truly change the world is not going to come through you setting up a social media account and somehow becoming Insta famous, right? It's <laughs> going to come through uh, followers of Jesus becoming more intentional um, and more uh, gospel focus in their everyday interactions with one person at a time. Mm. Life on life. Like you said, life, life on life. life. Um, before we go, I got to ask you because I'm reading through your bio and it says, uh, Kyle Eidelman lives on a farm uh, with his wife, Desiree and four children. Uh, I have to hear about this farm. And, and by the uh, way, I think you put in there something like, uh, but I don't do any farming. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't do any farming. So my wife grew up in a farm on a farm in Kansas. So she is a true farmer's daughter. And so she and my oldest daughter um, run like a, a horse equine uh, uh, business out of that farm. And so I live on it with them, but I don't do I don't do any actual farming. I don't know the names of the animals that are on the farm, but uh, what kind of animals uh, do you have though? You have horses, obviously, is there other animals? And some goats and some dogs and, okay. you know, uh, that, that, that is not my world, but I enjoy the sanctuary of it. And our family's made a lot of memories there, but that is, uh, that is my, that is my wife's that's my wife's world. That is taking one uh, for the team, Kyle. That's what that is. <laughs> that's right. Listen, this has been a great conversation. Really appreciate you coming on. People need to go get the new book, One at a Time, The Unexpected Way God Wants to Use You to Change the World, releasing on January 11th. Can't believe it's 2022. Happy New Year to you. All the best. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get you back on some other time and, and talk some more sports and talk some more, some more of your next project, I'm sure, Kyle. But thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thanks, Jason. 
And many thanks to Kyle Eidelman for joining us here today at Sports Spectrum. You can watch his messages online. Just look up Southeast Christian Church in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. 30,000 people every week that he's ministering to. My goodness, that is quite the church that he is pastoring. And then this new book, which I'm sure will also reach a lot of people one at a time, The Unexpected Way God Wants to Use You to Change the World, releasing January 11th. You can go get that everywhere books are found. Appreciate Kyle for being here today on the show. Love the John Wooden story. I mean, that's just such a cool thing when you can meet a legend like that. And John's been dead now for almost a decade, maybe. Maybe it's been only five years or so, but it feels longer. But what a a cool experience, right? To meet one of the great leaders of all time and John Wooden and the impact that he's made. And then talking about success. I really thought that was a big takeaway for me was hearing him talk about his definition of success, which so many of us in the sports world kind of kind of get messed up, right? We kind of mix that up a little bit when we think success is about all the pats on the back and all the contracts and the wins and the losses. And I love those, believe me, but it really true success to me is about, you know, life on life relationship, meeting people, impacting people, serving people. That's my definition of true success. And certainly Kyle was great talking about that as well. So we appreciate him for being here. We appreciate you as well for tuning in today. Thank you for checking us out. If this is the first time you've come across Sports Spectrum, well, welcome to the show. Make sure you do sign up for our weekly newsletter so that you never miss anything what's going on with Sports Spectrum. You can sign up at sportspectrum.com. You click that newsletter icon at the top. You can also subscribe to our magazine. We have a quarterly magazine, four issues uh, each year. It's super cheap. It's $18, and you can do that right now at sportspectrum.com. And make sure you subscribe to this podcast as well. That way you never miss an episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast, The Intersection of Sports and Faith, bringing Jesus into the sports conversation. So we appreciate you for checking us out. Tune in next time, and Happy New Year to y'all. And I hope you'll tune in when we have a brand new episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast coming your way next time. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you then. Have a great rest of your day.